come back in the evening and human nature being what it is, guess what? Everyone just showed up. Oh, great, I can sleep in a little bit more. That's <laughs> uh, what usually happened. We really encourage you, um, take the opportunity to take advantage of learning as much of the Word of God as you can. And Sunday school is a great opportunity. Also, Wednesday night Bible study, 7 o'clock here. Uh, or you can join us. Some people will work until a later time. It's really hard for them to be able to feel like they can get home or even get something to eat and show up. Uh, join us through Facebook Live or through Zoom. Uh, you can join either way. And in the day in which we live, we don't need less of the Word of God. We need more of the Word of Amen. God in our lives. And uh, Christians seem to be retreating rather than advancing. And uh, we need to stop. We need to set our feet, plant it, and we need to grow. If you want to see America change, it's not going to change through the White House. It's going to change through us, the church, becoming what God wants us to be. So we really strongly encourage you to uh, really take advantage of the opportunities that God has given to you uh, in these days. Because I'm going to tell you folks, if an election goes one way or another, you may not have those opportunities like you do now. Right. So really want to encourage you to take advantage of what God is offering you and enabling you to be able to do. Our other one is going to, our other announcement was this coming Wednesday, uh, we still probably might be able to put a Bible study to it. Uh, for a while, the coronavirus was spiking, and now they're saying it's receding nationwide. Numbers are dropping, uh, they're wondering. And so what we want to do is we wanted some input on, on the fall schedule. If corona spikes, mm -hmm. what do we want to do? Uh, we made the decision last March between Daniel and I and Bob that maybe the best thing at that point was to pull back and and that it probably was the best decision at that time. But in the future, what would we like to do? Uh, we usually end uh, September, the first Sunday in September, right before Labor Day. Usually we have a picnic, uh, our worship at Bright Creek Park. I want to talk about that and, and uh, should we go with that? Should we not do it or what should we do? Uh, we're followed by a picnic lunch there, but uh, also, we have fall festival, you know, just kind of wanting some input into the decisions. And so that's Wednesday at 7, a congregational meeting. If you're not a member, you're still invited to attend. Uh, that way, just be helpful rather than placing the decision on three people to have a little bit of input so that we can kind of know where everyone is, you know, because if you go, I was talking to my brother-in-law this week, Tim Bixby, there are missionaries in France, Ruth is Rebecca's sister. He said they've been in different churches throughout their time home in the last couple of months. He said, one pastor said, uh, you cannot believe how much strife there has been in the church just to try to come back one little step at a time. We are blessed that we have not had that because a lot of churches are really going through a really hard time. So we are very blessed uh, that way. Uh, and again, if you aren't able to attend a service, if you're not feeling well, <clears throat> or if uh, something, you know, whatever it might be, we do stream those services uh, through Zoom and through Facebook Live, so you can uh, join them that way. Uh, they are later uploaded to YouTube, uh, Bethel Bible Church of Berwick, and you can take advantage of going through and viewing any service that you don't, aren't able to attend uh, that way. All the announcements for this morning, let's start with number 333. Number 333, we'll sing this through twice this morning. Number 333.
verse of the month is found in Psalm 118, verse 11. We'll say the verse, the reference, and the verse again. The, the reference again. Psalm 119, 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119, 11. Hymn number 14. Number 14 will stand as we sing all stanzas. Number 14.
them to meet their needs, that you be with the web, so as they travel and evangelism, that you would continue to guide them and provide for them, that you would give very your power as he preaches your word. We thank you for all that you'll do in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Number 357. 357. Remain seated as we sing all stanzas. 357. <laughs> Nor may she drink wine or similar drink, nor eat anything unclean. 
All that I command her, let her observe. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Let's turn now to hymn number 380. Number 380 will stand as we sing both stanzas. Number 380. So as we ended the series on joy in our life, I was contemplating uh, what to do next, and there's two series, but I can only do one at a time. <clears throat> Otherwise, you'd be rather confused if I went back and forth. So uh, the one will be coming a little bit later. This one we're going to look at is on Samson. Years ago, there was a book <clears throat> written by Gary Enrig, I believe his name was. I have it on my, uh, it was one I don't have, but it was on the book of Judges. It was called uh, Heart of Iron, Feet of Clay, and it described the book of Judges. Uh, the book of Judges is one of the saddest books in all the Old Testament. Joshua leads the children of Israel, the second generation into the promised land. And conquers all that needed conquering, but the problem in Joshua was he did all that he needed to do, and he left the tribes to do the cleanup. And the tribes did for a while. They went around defeating, but they also discovered something. They were stronger than those that were left, and so they put them in tribute. They made them their slaves. So they gave them, first of all, they made them pay money to them, but then they made them do the menial tasks that they didn't want to do. Chop wood, uh, fetch water, do things that, why would I, well, if I can have someone else do it, why should I do it? The problem was it led, it eventually led to the intermarrying of the Israelites with the heathen culture. And rather, this is what usually happens it doesn't work where the Christian culture rubs off on the world culture. The worldly culture captures the Christian culture and sinks it. And so Judges is a book that shows us of Israel going in and out of basically heathenism. They're God's chosen people. But they continually fall back into idolatry and all that came with it. Remember, it wasn't just the worship of a false god. Immorality was a huge part of this false worship. Child sacrifice and many other uh, sins were committed in the worship of these idols. 
And so God brought judgment upon them. In time, Israel would cry out for God's deliverance, and God would send a judge. The theme of the book of Judges is a very simple verse that says, Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. We live in a culture today that that is the theme of the culture. Every man does that which is right in his own eyes. We call it uh, postmodernism or relativism, relativism, that what's truth, I will determine my truth for me, and you determine your truth for you, and we will agree to disagree, and we will be tolerant because uh, <clears throat> all roads lead to a wonderful place. Well, many roads lead to destruction, but only one road leads to the way of life, and it's Jesus Christ. He is the way, the way, the truth, and the life. Samson is one of the judges in Israel. He, to me, is one of the great enigmas of Scripture. He is chosen by God, yet he has worldly appetites. He judges Israel for 20 years, and yet he cannot overcome his own besetting sin. He suffers the consequences for his sin, yet he's listed in Hebrews 11 for his faith. He's a man that has a heart of faith, but feet of clay. In the next few weeks, as we unfold the story of Samson, I want us to see the things in his life that are pertinent for us today as we face a culture just like he did. The Philistines were... Uh, over Israel, they worshiped Dagon with all the immorality and, and sins that went with that. But he was a man that yet God commended and God used. But yet there's warnings in the life of Samson for all believers. And this morning, the first thing we want to look at as we read this, Judges 13, we did not read it in its entirety. But in verses 2 through 5 that we read, God tells <clears throat> uh, Manoah and his wife, that God is going to give them a son and that God has a plan for this son. The first thing we see from the life of Samson for us is that God has a plan for each life. God has a plan for each life. Your life is not an accident. Uh, for many years now in the public school setting, evolution has, biological evolution has been taught as truth that uh, one day there was all these gases that came, they don't, they, they don't know where they came from, but they're all swirling around and one day they just exploded and the whole universe is created and over millions and billions of years life came to be and our planet formed and, and cells somehow formed in, this prim, uh, in the goop that was on the earth and one day uh, a fish climbed out and went on the land and became human, and not human, but started off this whole process, and eventually monkeys turned into man, and I, I'm telling you what, it takes more faith to believe evolution than it was believed to simply God created. It takes more faith. But that's science, and that's what's taught as truth today, and, and uh, you're, you, you, you must believe science. Science is always true, and yet whenever I was growing up, eggs were bad for you, now they're good for you. Uh, this this medicine was good for you, now it's bad for you. So if you want me to believe science, be a little more consistent uh, about it. And, well, science is man, is man observing, and man does not know everything, and man is fallible. But uh, evolution has gone out then into uh, mold society. You say, how does the science philosophy mold society? Well. The, the aim of evolution is to say there is no God. If you came, if you're, you are a product of chance, there is no God. And uh, if there's no God, you can live your life the way you want to and do what you want. Every man can do that which is right in his own eyes because there's not a God that we're answerable to. And so we should be tolerant of everybody and everything. Because the Bible's a nice moral book is basically, that's the only nice thing they would say about it, that teaches man a nice way to live, but it's not good for anything else. Well, society today lives, lives just like that. Every person is a product of chance. Their future and, dest and what, what the destiny in life is up to them. 
and uh, they can live however they want in the end, period. That's, and yet we wonder why our culture is so full of hopelessness and bent on destruction. Because if you look in Genesis, you'll see right before the flood, the earth was filled with violence. And every man did that which was right in his own eyes, uh, applies in that, in that thing, in that, in that setting. But also, they did evil continually before God. Life is not an accident. God creates every life for a purpose. Your life has significance for two reasons. Number one, because God made you. And if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, number two, because Christ redeemed you. Your life, for those two reasons, all life has value. Simply because God created all life, but especially for those who are believers and know Christ as your Savior, because Christ redeemed you. Now Paul in the New Testament many times uses the word servant. Paul, a servant of God. That word servant means slave. Paul, a slave of God. A slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. Every person is a slave, Romans tells us. Either you're a slave to sin and the devil and his way of life, or you are a slave unto righteousness and doing the right thing. Every person, like many people, I, I like to do my own thing. I'll live my life my own way. No, you won't. You'll live it according to an evil nature if you walk apart from God. Period. Now what is this implication from Samson for our lives? God had a plan for Samson's life. God has a plan for each one. You are his child. He made you for a reason. And he wants you to be serving him. Now it's also, you say, but what can God do with me? Notice that this man is from the tribe of Dan. A Danite. The tribe of Dan is not a significant tribe in Israel. When you usually hear of the, of the tribes, you think of Judah. It was the one that the kings came from. Uh, the Levites were the religious instructors and leaders of, of the nation. Ephraim was known for its uh, aggressiveness. It was a very powerful tribe. Benjamin was the smallest tribe, but a very powerful tribe. Dan, Asher, Naphtali, some of these other ones aren't as well known. Some of them are more in the agricultural section of Israel. So it's, when I say it's not, it's, it is significant, but really it's not a known tribe. It borders right north of the land of the Philistines. So God had a plan for Samson, no matter how insignificant his background. He wasn't from a significant family in the tribe of Dan. His mom only, he, he, she had no children up to him. We don't know if there were more or not. God has a plan for your life no matter how insignificant you feel you are or from what background you came from. But this fits in with our next verse. Look at verse 5. It says, Your son, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. Number two, God has a perfect will for each one to follow. God has a perfect will for each one to follow. Now the Nazarite vow was a special. Sometimes it was just for a, a period of time, a certain period of time. Other times it was for a lifetime. For Samson it was going to be a lifetime vow that God had for him. Uh, that's why his hair was never to be cut. That's why his mom, his mother, was not to drink wine. He was already alcoholic beverages. She was not to eat uh, uh, grapes. That was part of the vow. Samson, in his life, was not to drink wine or eat grapes or take, partake of the, uh, of the fruit of the vine. He was not to touch uh, any dead bodies or carcasses. We'll see him violate that one. Uh, he pretty much violates all the Nazarite vows along the way. He was set aside for, it was a sign that he was set aside to God for special service. 
Now again, sometimes it was just for a short time. Sometimes it was for a lifetime. This one for it was for a lifetime. I want us to look in Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12. God had a plan for Samson's life. And he had a perfect will for each to follow. Now, what is God's perfect will? God's plan for your life where you stand on course and follow him completely. In verse chapter 12, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, up through the, the theme of the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, says, here's the theme. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes. The theme of Romans is the gospel. And Paul goes through, from chapter after starting in chapter 1, verse 16, all the way through the end of chapter 11, and expands on what the gospel is. It is about our guilt before God and the condemnation we justly face. It, about, it is about justification. God taking my record of sin and putting it on his son in Calvary. And whenever I put my faith in Christ alone, God taking my Christ's perfect record of no sin and putting it, imputing it to me is the biblical word, putting it on my account in place of my record of sin. My sin is dealt with as a believer on Calvary. God dealt with it through, through the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it's about my sanctification, the gospel, me becoming more like the Lord Jesus Christ in how I talk, how I think, my attitudes, and my actions. Well, then it goes on to talk about my security in Christ and God choosing me for, from before the foundation of the world. God, he goes through all the way through Romans 11 explaining all these Wonderful truths of the gospel. When he comes to verse 1, he says, Therefore, because of the gospel, this is the first thing, first impact the gospel should have on the life of a believer. That you become a living sacrifice unto God, a slave unto God. God, here's me. Here's my will. God gives each of us a free will. God is not going to make us serve him. God is not going to make us follow him. You have to make that choice. What is God's perfect will for every believer? First of all, to become a living sacrifice. God, here I am. I don't know what you can do with my life, but that's not for me to figure out. We have to make a definite decision in time that says, God, here am I. Here's my life. You want to know the biggest problem in American Christianity today is this. Christians want, to serve, want, to, want God for all the goodness, but they want to continue to live their own life with their own demands. You can't have it both ways. Jesus said you cannot love, serve two masters. It was the same problem that Paul faced in his day. Why is it such a problem? Because we have a sinful the world inside of us. Somewhere around age, I, it wasn't just a one official time, but around age 16, I was sophomore, junior in high school. And uh, I began thinking about college because you know when you're sophomore, junior in high school, that's not that far off. So I was looking and wondering, what should I do in life? I, I uh, loved education. So my thought was, I'll be, I loved history, maybe I could be a social studies teacher uh, along the way. And we were going to a, a, a church, and God began to use the preaching of uh, Pastor Rhodes and, and really the personal discipleship of Pastor Holly. And uh, God used, of course, my mom and my grandparents in my life greatly also. And I began to feel maybe God wanted me, not in education, but maybe God wanted me to serve him some way. And so there came a time I finally had to make a decision. And the decision was this. God, my life is yours. You died for me. You redeemed me. It's yours. It's not mine to live how I want. It's yours. 
And so I gave my life to God, and then God showed me the path that he wanted me to go. Was it all clear right then? No. I, I, I believe God wanted me to some type of full-time Christian servant. So uh, what college to go to? I chose Bob Jones University. Uh, what major? I chose to be, uh, I believe God wanted me to be, to be a Bible major. And then what about grad school? You know, because, uh, and so I went into grad school. I said I was only going to do uh, one degree. And God says, yeah, watch this. And he finished, sent me right through the Master of Infinity. I mean, Infinity. It took me a long time to finish that thing. And, uh, well, then there's even bigger questions. Well, God, who do you have for me to marry? My mom had, uh, my dad had left my mom high and dry seven years after they were married, not playing, with two children. I knew it was very important to know who God wanted me to marry. And so God, uh, I didn't realize that right under my nose was my co-worker that would be, that God already chosen, but God did. And God had us working at 7 o'clock in the morning, folding laundry. Let me tell you, at 7 o'clock in the morning, folding laundry, you don't hide anything. You get to know a real person. And, uh, well, God, where do you want me to serve? Where do you want us to go? And God opened each door of the way. But I had to make a one-time decision that said, God... My life is yours. But here was the second part. It has to be a daily surrender at the same time. I finally had to make up my mind, follow Christ. But I had to make a second step every morning. When my feet hit the floor of this life is not my life. It belongs to God. So if it means punching a, a time clock at Dollar Tree, that's God's will for me. I punch a time clock at Dollar Tree. But God doesn't have me in that building just to move boxes. Because people work there. That's my ministry. God has a will for me every day. And there's a perfect will to follow. But folks, we can't just... Well, what, what should I do? we got to make the decision. We're going to follow Christ. We're going to follow Christ. And Samson was always torn between those two. In verse 2, he says, Be not conformed to this world. Stop being influenced and molded by a culture that is against God. There's a lot of terminology out there today in, in Christian circles. Redeem the culture. Forget the culture. You get redeemed and become what God wants you to be in the culture. God wants us to be salt in the light. Not influenced and molded in our own opinions and our own thoughts by this culture that we live in. Let me say it this way. You ought to know more of the word of God than you do about pop culture. And you ought to be more influenced by the word of God in your thinking and in your life than you are by the culture. Because that's the second effect of the gospel. And then look at verse 3. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to him, each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individual members one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Let us use them. What is God saying here next? What is the third effect of the, uh, uh, of, of the gospel? One is we become a living sacrifice. Giving our lives to God every day. Number two, we stop being influenced and molded by this world. And we live a life that is being changed by walking with God every single day of our lives. And the third thing is we get busy serving God. Using the talents and the abilities that God has given to us. Someone defined football this way. 22 guys on the field desperately in need of, of arrest and 65,000 people standing in those, around them uh, desperately in need of exercise. Often what happens in the Christian life and the Christian culture of today is we have a lot of people standing around rather than getting involved, serving God with their, with their lives and saying, God, here I am. Use me, I pray. Use my talents that you've given to me. You use my abilities. Help me know how I can serve you. In my job, through my church, 
in my neighborhood, especially in my family. Help me, Lord, know how I can serve you. Go back to Judges chapter 13. God has a plan for each life. God has a perfect will for each to follow. Noah and his wife were a very godly couple. I encourage you to read Judges 13 over the next day and just, just look at the faith of Manoah and his wife. Incredible. Especially in a culture, they're, they're, they're part of the Danite tribe who was right at this point overrun by the Philistines because of the wickedness of the Jewish culture. And here stands a man and his wife, not like the culture around them, but spiritually minded, spiritually focused, Christ-like examples. Which leads us to number three. Spiritual parents do not guarantee a child's spiritual success. Spiritual parents do not guarantee a child's spiritual success. Let me say it this way. Unspiritual minded parents will probably have unspiritually minded children. So how does that affect us today? Each child must make the right spiritual decision for his or her life. Parents are to mold their children for the Lord. But each child must choose to be spiritually minded. There's a reason that God says in Ephesians chapter 3, Fathers, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Let me tell you what's the problem in American culture today. The media, even the news media is saying, boy, it's fatherlessness. It's one step more than fatherlessness. It's unspiritually minded fathers. We need men of God who will rise up say, by the grace of God, I'm going to be a spiritual leader and a spiritual man to those around me. This is what we need. Samson had it, but Samson didn't always make spiritual decisions. Parents, you're not responsible for their decisions. We can guide them, we can mold them, but let me say to each of you here this morning, there are some of you who may have come from a rich spiritual heritage. Thank God that you did and take advantage of the fact that you did. And there may be those here this morning, you didn't have spiritual minded parents. But let me say this, by the grace of God, you can become a spiritually minded Christian. Does everyone understand that? Samson had golden opportunities. You. I really encourage you to take time in Judges 13 and just look at the faith of Manoah. What a godly man he was in contrast to the culture. And that's what God wants us to be. If we have children still at home, he wants us to be shaping them and molding them in the ways of Christ. And let me tell you the number way they're gonna, that that's going to happen is what they see, not just what they hear. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. But it doesn't matter what background you came from. You can be a spiritually minded person. But you have got to be willing to be Manoah and his wife in a culture that is not living for God and not a spiritual culture. You have got to be the one to choose Every day to go back and live God's plan for your life. But Samson, this is where we really get to the heart of Samson. Chapter 14, verse 1. Now Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. So he went up and told his father and mother, saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore, 
get her for me as a wife. What's wrong with this? And God had told the Israelites not to intermarry with the heathen cultures around them. Why? In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, to come out from them and be separate, saith the Lord. Jesus said, pray in the Garden of Gethsemane, that we would be his children, the, the children of God, Christians would be in the world, but not of the world. Here's what happens. <clears throat> Is in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul says that unbeliever, that a believer should not be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. Well, why? Why was it such a big deal? Because most of the time, the Christian does not change the non-Christian. The culture of the non-Christian changes the believer. They stop being spiritually minded. They stop being a person desiring to please God, and they kind of slide into, first of all, they love, lose that first love that Paul, uh, Jesus told about the Ephesian church. He says, you've lost your first love. They have lost the enthusiasm of loving God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then they, the next step is they slide into the Laodicean churches where they're this lukewarm. They're not either. They're not hot spiritually and living for God, but neither are they exactly unspiritual. They're just kind of sitting there in the middle, like lukewarm water. The third step is they begin to fall away and love the world more than they love God. They become like demons, having loved this present world. And they begin to slip away. They stop reading their Bibles. They stop thinking of God a lot. They uh, stop going to church and missing church more and more. Actually start usually getting irritated with people who ask them, hey, are you okay? What's going on in your life? And then as they're not fellowshipping with God, they lose their joy. They lose that peace that comes with him. They lose security in life, and they begin to replace it with old habits of life. Whatever those old habits might be. You must be weary of your spiritual weaknesses and guard your heart against them. This one, and later Delilah, Samson wouldn't transform them. They would transform Samson. So let's make Samson such an enemy. He was a man who struggled. Yet God could use. God had a perfect will for Samson, and it was not to go find a wife from those that God had explicitly said, do not marry intermarry with that culture. Because you are not going to redeem them. They are going to transform you. They're going to make you fall away. And it would become the theme or one of the, the, the setting sins it would be of Samson, his Achilles heel, heel that would ultimately lead to his downfall. You see, what happens? Am I going to sin and fail God today? Yes. Why? Because I'm a sinner saved by the grace of God, yet I still have a sin nature that I battle with every day. That's why I have to get up every morning and say, Lord, this life is yours. It's not mine. Use me. For what you can. But there's times throughout the day, yes, I feel God and I must go and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I was wrong when I said that. I was wrong when I thought that. I was wrong in that attitude. I was wrong in that action. Please forgive me. And when we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he restores that relationship. And there are times that I do things that God has to say, you know what? There's got to be consequences. 
David went and took another man's wife and slept with her. And then ultimately had her husband killed. And God put consequences on David's life for the rest of his life. And David had to live with those consequences. So that's why I need to stay as close to God's perfect will as I can. And not stray away and do those big sins, or you might want to call them something like that, and stay away from God from long periods of time. Because God may say, I'm going to need to put consequences in your life to make sure you don't go that way again. And God may never remove those consequences. But that's where I have to learn to trust a God who knows better than I do. That's why it's important to take advantage of the Opportunities that God gives to each of us. In America, we, we, we talked about this in the first part of the church service. God has given us as Americans unique opportunities. If you lived in a Muslim country today or a communist country, you could not gather in a house of worship and freely worship God without fear of persecution of some sort. In America, we are very blessed even though freedoms have eroded through the years, that we can still read the Word of God, that we can still possess the Word of God, that we can still come and worship together. And yet, how dearly do we hold to that? How much do we treasure the fact that we can hear the Word of God and that the government's not saying, oh, you can't say that, not yet at least. That we can grow in our walk with the Lord and not fear persecution. How often do we treasure that? How often do we take advantage of that? Or is this Christianity something that we just take for granted? And we just kind of float and bob along. Here, we have a Sunday school starting. If you're a new believer, let me encourage you. Get up earlier. And take advantage of learning the basics of Christian life. I, I, a lot of folks would say, well, you know, Sunday's a day to sleep in, and yet tomorrow at 6 o'clock in the morning, my behind will be out of bed because i got to be clocked in on a job at a certain time. If, my job, if I could hold my job in that kind of uh, of, what do you call that? Not Priority. whatever. Huh? Priority. Priority. Why can't I hold a Sunday school class to learn more about my God and that kind of thing? My job is temporary. I'm going to be living with my God for eternity. Wednesday night. Why can't we join <clears throat> and learn more about our God and, and how to live the Christian life? If you get home late from church, I understand. And that's one of the reasons we took a step of faith to add internet to the church so we can minister to people. How many of us tomorrow morning get up and, or at some point tomorrow, get up and read the scriptures or take a verse or two and think about it or, or write it out or do something? How often do we take advantage of prayer? God has given us all these resources. And God says, I want you to make a choice. I want you to take advantage of all these opportunities that you might become like Christ, that you would walk in my perfect will. And folks, the perfect will of God is not necessarily flashy. Whenever I'm driving a forklift and a pallet goes over, let me tell you, that's not a real fancy type of the will of God. I've got to get off the forklift and restack a pallet. I always like to say it wasn't my fault. If it was, maybe it was. But you know what? God says, okay. So what do you do? You, yeah, yeah, I usually get upset because now I got, what's God's will for me in that? To pick it up with the right attitude. Samson has a problem. Hebrews 12 says, let us lay aside the weight and the sin which does so easily beset me. That sin that I am more likely to commit, I need to set aside. I need to learn how to overcome it. 
I need to learn to guard my heart with all diligence. And Samson is a man, as we're going to see unfold in the next weeks, that God used in a mighty way. And it doesn't matter what our background is. God can use each of us. We have to step up and say, God, you're mine. We've got to get serious about our lives and, and guard our hearts. That we're not going to be part of the culture of the day. In fact, we're going to cut the culture off, off in our lives and the entertainment choices that are influencing us. And we're going to let God become the one who molds us and makes us. Samson is also one of the great examples the mercy and grace of God. But folks, let me tell you, as an individual and as a pastor, it's a lot easier to avoid this sin than it is to get out of this sin. And it's a lot easier to build it, your life right the first time rather than to have to go down, back, tear down the wrong choices and rebuild a life because at that point, the damage has already been done. The damage has already been done. So what do we learn from these this morning? Let me ask you some questions in closing. Are you a Christian that is saying, Lord, here am I? You have a plan for my life. I may not understand. That's okay. Let me tell you, I don't understand what God does and what God wants from me every day. That's okay. I don't have to. He says, trust me. But have you ever finally ever just stepped up and said, Lord, this life is yours. It's not mine. You created me. You redeemed me. I want to be a living sacrifice. And then each day, you get up and you say, here am I. This life is yours. It's not mine. If any man would come after me, let him follow me. Deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. That's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to learn to say no to the old sin nature by sin nature, by the power and your grace, your power and your grace. I'm going to get help where I need help so I can grow spiritually. I'm going to ask questions. I'm going to listen, not hear. I'm going to put it into practice. I'm, I'm going to be a Christian Lord who, who I, I want to not let the world and this culture influence me anymore. I want the word of God to be that which shapes me. I'm going to become more faithful in a Sunday school class, to Sunday morning service, to at least trying to join on a Wednesday night if I can't make it on time. So that God can transform my life. And every day, this life is yours. If you have children in your home, they need to see this every day in your life. Not by what you say only, but by how you live. And it doesn't matter what background you came from. God is remaking us all. And God wants to remake you and transform you into a trophy of his grace. To make you what he wants you to be. But every one of us has that inside of us that could destroy us. A besetting sin that we must guard our hearts diligently. That's what God wants for us. Samson, God uses him. But I'm pretty sure Samson would say at the end, if I had avoided my besetting sin, what more? that God have done with you. Maybe this morning you've gotten off track. Maybe some things in life have begun to slip back up. Let me say this to you. God is a God of grace and mercy. And he's waiting for you to return. With repentance. Say, Lord, I was wrong. Here's my life. Remold. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We help 
ask that you would help us understand in the, this series on Samson, Lord, of your mercy and your grace, but Lord, let's also learn to make wise choices each day and how they affect our lives. Help us to be Christians, Lord, that are not like the culture around us, Lord. We stand out from the culture because we're Christ. We grow in Christ-like qualities and characteristics, and, and when people see us, Lord, they actually can see the Lord Jesus Christ shining through us. Help us to desire to be that kind of Christian today. We would be transforming and growing, and Lord, we know that the struggle is real. But help us to learn from this man. Help us to be a, a person who returns to you when we fall and, and ask you to forgive, but Lord, we would also know our hearts. Like Paul said there, and in them dwells no good thing that, Lord, we would rely upon Christ and, and take advantage of the things that you have given us, the opportunities to grow and our walk with you. Help us to do this each day in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Turning closing this morning, number 369. 369, we'll stand as we sing just the first stanza. Just the first stanza, number 369. <laughs>